Though the Targaryens had forged the Seven Kingdoms in fire and blood, they didn't govern with them until they did. Maegor, first of his name, defined council as confirmation and disagreement as treason. Three grand maesters tried to avert disaster. Instead of taking their advice, Maegor took their heads. As a second son and exile, Maegor was never meant to rule. But no sooner did Maegor hear of his brother's death than he flew Balerion to Dragonstone and demanded the crown. Only the Grand Maester dared object that the throne should pass to his older brother's firstborn son, Prince Aegon. Maegor insisted that the Iron Throne should go to the man with the strength to seize it and beheaded the Grand Maester. Prince Aegon soon took him at his word. He claimed his father's dragon, raised a host of Westermen, and marched on King's Landing while Maegor was in Old Town. Far from the capital, Maegor couldn't rally an army to match Aegon's, so he ordered his banners to swarm Aegon's larger army from all sides, confusing the young prince and slowing his advance. Beneath the gods' eye, Maegor's disparate forces came together and attacked Aegon as Maegor himself swooped down from the clouds. For the first time since the Doom of Valyria, dragon fought dragon in the sky. But Aegon's dragon was no match for Valyrian the Dread, who was four times its size. When Aegon fell to his death, his army broke and fled. For slaying his own nephew, Mago forever after became known as the Cruel. Though, of course, not to his face. The next Grand Maester dared object to Mago taking a third wife, when taking his second wife had ruined his brother's reign, because Mago's first wife was the niece of the High Septon. But Mago beheaded the Grand Maester and declared war on the faith. He set fire to the Riverlands, the Westerlands, and the Reach in a campaign to root out disloyal lords, and sponsored a more pliant High Septon. None of it worked. Mago may have returned to the capital with 2,000 skulls of the Faith Militant, but most of them weren't soldiers. They were simple folk who had sheltered the outlaw Septons, or turned out in droves to hear them denounce the Wicked King. The third Grand Maester dared to declare Mago the father of his own heir. But when his second wife miscarried and Mago saw the monstrous stillbirth, Mago beheaded the Grand Maester for his insolent adherence to truth. So he had no one to warn him when his third wife, sensing an advantage, declared that his second wife had been unfaithful and produced a list of potential fathers of the misshapen child. Not only did Magor execute his second wife and her father, his own hand of the king, but he also marched on her family's castle and slaughtered everyone who bore a drop of her family's blood. But his third wife couldn't give him a child either. Desperate to cement his stolen throne with an heir, Mago took three wives at once, known as the Black Brides because each were women he'd widowed in his wars. All three women grew full with child in time, but each gave birth to the same twisted monstrosities as his second wife. One need not be a maester, much less a grand maester, to deduce the common thread here. Though Magor stamped out the fires of rebellion, his cruelty and fear only scattered more tinder over the realm until even the smallest ember could set the realm alight. One day, the Faith Militant emerged from the shadows, and the Lord sent to quash it joined it instead. His hand resigned and retired to his island home. Finally, House Baratheon declared for Magor's own nephew as the rightful king. The Lannisters, Tyrells, and Arryns soon joined adding more than half the might of Westeros to the prince and his two dragons, which became three when Magor's niece and involuntary Black Bride stole away from the Red Keep with her dragon. Her treason wasn't even the last. Magor's own Lord Admiral sailed the royal fleet into his nephew's harbor, but most fitting of all, when Magor tried to send ravens to call his banners, he found that his fourth Grand Maester had learned from his predecessors and fled. Magor spent one final night on the Iron Throne. He was found in the morning with his wrists slashed and one of the throne's blades jutting from his throat. Nobody knows if it was one of his queens or king's guard or one of the thousands who wanted him dead or even Magor himself, frustrated that his body had failed his will. 
Whoever the culprit, no doubt he died as all tyrants do, believing that history would vindicate him. It hasn't. History may be written with fire and blood, but histories aren't. As any good advisor could have warned him. <laughs>